uh, so dear and respected friends i would request you to kindly mute yourself so that we can avoid disruptions thank you so much uh, let us begin the session with an invocation of a spiritual song of lord ganesha dedicated to the festival of ganesh chaturthi so let me share the screen thank you so much for your kind attention may lord ganesha be always there to enlighten you with knowledge with wisdom to be your mentor to be your guide and to be your protector varun vishes on ganesh chaturthi 2021 namaste everyone i randhir kumar gautam on behalf of school of humanities and social sciences of raffles university i welcome everyone i also welcome you on behalf of swadhya sahachakra circle for creative co learning bispinidan center for asian blossoming and rage global foundation usa it's a great pleasure and indeed an honor to have available with us distinguished speaker dr sambhu chhatri visiting professor rakhi center of excellence for the science of happiness from iit kharagpur we welcome you sir we welcome professor anand kumar giri our guide and a professor from madras institute of development studies chennai we welcome maniti pradhan a creative thinker and a poet from orisha honorable vice chancellor of raffles university professor divakar gohli deepika behan from rage global foundation i would like to extend a very warm welcome to our chief patron honorable justice dr meena v bombar former chief justice of rajasthan high court and all the respected participant swadesh sah chakra family viewers and listeners let me give a brief introduction to our swadesh sah chakra swadesh sah chakra is an initiative of studying and learning together self culture societies and the world friends associated with this are eager to walk and mediate with new horizons of thinking and new movements of social and cultural change at work in our contemporary world we study seekers such as maharshi arvindo chitranjan das a creative thinker from orisha mahatma gandhi and many others from around the world we also present our own writings and reflect our creativity together we also invite seekers from different fields of life to share us with with us their lives their sadhana struggle for creating a world of beauty dignity and dialogue we meet every sunday or sometimes on wednesday now we are nurturing this dialogue in collaboration with the school of humanities and social science and raffles university and rage global foundation usa today is a very special topic to discuss that is happiness well-being and anand aristotle once said happiness is the meaning and purpose of life the whole aim and end of human existence is happiness nowadays lots of people talk about positive psychology across the discipline even happiness index considered to be the one of the hallmark of the measurement of development so this topic you know it triggers out fascination and curiosity to know about the topic like well being health and happiness happiness is all that matters for well being 
how to create a life of happiness is one of the significant questions that we try to find a proper answer. Dalai Lama once said that as human beings, we all want to be happy and free from misery. With this brief introduction, now I would like to invite Professor Anand Kumar Giri, sir, to kindly share his presentation. Sir, Thank over you. to you. Thank you so much, uh, dear Randi. I had a word with Professor Chetri. So Professor Chetri would kindly go, sir, then I would come. And I would also like to share, dear and respected friends today, Professor Chetri would take up to 40 minutes, and mm -hmm. I would make a presentation. I would try to, and then, okay. and then Minati, and maybe after we make two presentations, let us have discussion for ten minutes, mm -hmm. and then after that, we will have Minati and your presentation and discussion for ten minutes. You know, beginning with a rhythm like this. So now we invite Professor Chetri, please. Thank you. To make, make him co-host so that he can share his screen. Yes, yes, I have already. Is my screen visible? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So I begin with a very challenging uh, question here. Is happiness really difficult to chase. With this thought, let's continue our journey today. Um, as we continue our journey, I would request all of you to listen to your breathing in and out. Just flow with the breath, breath in and out and keep your ears to what I'm saying. Thank you. So what is happiness? Now, if you look into um, the concept of happiness, we had great thinkers um, for, you know, since the humanities understood, you know, that we need to be happy. Thinkers like Plato, Aristotle, Confucius, they all talked about in being in process. And if you see Tao, Tao itself means path, the way. So if you look deeply into the concept of what they tried to talk about happiness, they would talk about virtues, our actions, our activities. Everything was in the process, in terms of process. So if our process was wrong, the outcome is going to be wrong. And that's how it will lead us either to feel unhappy or happy. Um, thinkers like, uh, you know, uh, Mahatma Gandhi said that if what we think, what we say, and what we act or, you know, our actions, if they all synchronized together, then we need to, we will be happy. Dalai Lama said, happiness is not ready-made. It comes with your action. Great, great way of saying putting things together. And if you think about Buddha, Buddha said, the way to happiness, happiness is the way. What does that mean? That means that happiness is all within us. It's not outside of us. All right, so is happiness a choice? And definitely having read many books on happiness, I would say, yes, happiness is a choice. Uh, I need to get this um, sliders out. Yes, sorry, yes, thank you. Um, so happiness is a choice. That's what we all talk about because happiness is within and it's not outside. So is happiness collective? Definitely happiness is collective because you cannot be happy in a space where there's so much of unhappiness. And we know from the quantum physics that unhappiness has a lot of negativity. When a person is unhappy, he or she is living with hedonic movements and to achieve something, she's, she or he is struggling. And all that to achieve, all the struggles actually do not make us happy. And if there are people unhappy around us, we will also imbibe the mirror neurons we also imbibe unhappiness for ourselves. Can, buy, uh, can money buy happiness? Definitely no. There's a lot of studies on this. Money cannot buy happiness. 
but money is required to a certain extent. Are rich people happier than poor? No, not at all, because rich people tend to struggle for more and more so that they can continue to live at that space. And poor people are content, they're happy with what they have, and they try to get more. Of course, it doesn't mean that they're happy for forever in life, but they tend to be content with the acceptance, the word acceptance, they accept what we have. We, we don't have more, so why struggle to live a happier life? And I'll talk more about our connection with nature. When you are a poor guy in the farm, you know, you are much happier than the rich uh, guy in the town. The reasons I'll talk later. Happiness is a state of mind, we all know. It's an inner quality and being at peace. Now, with all the kind of reading I had, this is the definition I came about. There's no one definition for happiness. And I think we cannot have one definition for happiness, definitely. Happiness is not the fleeting momentary feel good moods, which we often associate ourselves for happiness. It is a balance between spiritual needs and the uh, material needs for the mind and the body. You know? And it has to be in a very secure and sustained environment. What is enough for us should as well be enough for centuries after us, for our generations to come. So with this introduction, let me continue my journey. It's happening, it's not shifting. Okay. All right, so, you know, this is Einstein. What did Einstein have to say on happiness? Um, uh, of course, this was a note that he wrote uh, for a bellboy in the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. He didn't have money. So he wrote this note for him, which was sold uh, by the way, for 1.6 million, you know, uh, maybe two few years ago, and it was bought by an Israeli. So it's in the uh, museum in the Israel. All right. So let's get it translated. What does it really mean? It means a calm and humble life will bring more happiness than the pursuit of success and the constant restlessness that comes with it. Beautiful. So if we accept our life in a very humble way. And, you know, we will definitely bring happiness because we're not pursuing success. What are we pursuing? We are pursuing satisfaction. Because if you pursue success, con you will be constantly restless because you need to achieve many things down the line. And for that matter, we need to work here and now. Um, we can't leave yesterday or tomorrow. The only day we have is today. So do we work? Do we create the process today? rightly is the big question for all of us. So, um, so let me just embark into, oh God, it's not, um, so what determines happiness? There are a lot of, sorry, there are a lot of people joining and going, so I'm getting my screen a little disturbed, never mind. So bear with me, please. So what determines happiness? So if you look into Sonia Limbers Muski, she said, uh, this is from the research, the genetic research that she did, that she said that 50% is determined by our genes, the genetics that we are born with. She said 40% is from our circumstances and 10% is determined by our internal state of mind. Now let's, let's for the sake of uh, debate or discussion, let's think about Abhimanyu in Mahabharata. You know, he could break the chakra view or the fortification in the war field up to seven fortifications and then he was killed. Where did he learn this? And the, the story tells us that when his father was narrating the story to his mother, he was in the womb and he listened that in the womb. And we know that uh, Arya Anand B. Babu from South India, from Kerala, she uh, was in Little Champion at Champs, I think in 2020, and she could sing so beautifully all song, songs of our uh, you know, singing Nightingale of India, uh, Sri Lata Mangeshkar, uh, Sri Mati Lata, Lata Mangeshkar Ji. Um, so beautifully, but if he had, she had to talk a verse on Hindi or speak Hindi, she wouldn't speak anything on Hindi. So where did she learn? This was also proven by a doctor who came along with her to say that her mother is an avid listener of the songs of Lata Mangeshkar Ji. 
when the child was in the womb. From then on, she's been very much listening all through. So the child learned right from her young days. Now, if you listen to the Bruce Edge Lipton, another great Dr. Bruce, great man, a genetic scientist, he's done research over 25 years to say that all our genes are blueprints. We can change them the way we want, simply because from one, from birth to seven years is the time where the child hypnotically takes all the information in, whether she's asking, is asking, or sensing, or seeing, or doing anything, they just kind of record everything. And where does this get recorded? In the subconscious, in a sense. It's like learning cycling. You, you know, in the beginning you fall and you don't know when to steer, when to paddle, but after a while, you just know how to cycle. You don't have to think about how do, how do I steer anymore, or for that matter, the car, or writing our names. We don't have to think A, B, C, D, go to S to find S where the S remains, because it's already really written in the subconscious. That's what he says. And um, he says that in the team, you continue to evolve more, and you continue to write, rewrite your subconscious. And everything that memories are stored in the subconscious, which helps us, like when you're dri driving a car, we're thinking something else, but we know where we want to go and we very naturally steer our way through. You see? So this is written in the subconscious, he said. All right, let's continue. Vasudeva Kutummakam, the whole world is one family. Now I'm coming to just tell you something about understanding deeper self, who are we really? So that we know how can we translate ourselves and for others to be a happier human being. You know, one half seed of father, half seed of mother, they join together in the womb of the mother to form a diploid, haploid, haploid into a diploid, or we got call it zygote in biology. It is 0.005 inch, barely visible to our uh, naked eyes. That has all the code, where the nose should be, where the eyes should be, where the ears and the heart and rest of the elements in the body should be. You know, those, those, that one cell has all the codes, but what makes that one cell grow into a baby and be born? It is the food that we eat. So the term Bhagavan, I'm going to translate that. Bha stands for Bhumi. And in Vedanta, as they say, a human body constitutes 12% of Bha, Bhumi. Food, okay, we are made of a food. Bhaga, gagan, the sky. Sky is, uh, they don't proportion anything of the body in for sky, but they say all the five senses are from outside of the planet or the sky, right? Bhaga, one, bhaga, one. There is a in between ga and wa, but we don't write that. Agni. Now, if you uh, listen to Bruce Lipton, he says that, an average human cell between a young child to a grown up, full grown up man, uh, the total um, uh, you know, uh, cells that we constitute, average total cell that we constitute is 37.2 trillion, okay? 30.7.2 trillion cells, average. Maybe a Punjabi uh, in North India would have seven, 70 uh, trillion cells. Maybe I have less, maybe someone uh, you know, in the Eastern hemisphere, lower, they are smaller in body, they might have much less, and ch child has much less. So an average 37.2 trillion cells. Now, what he says is that every cell has equal, so much energy, when that, if that was translated into voltage, it would have 1.4 volt per cell. Now, multiply that with 37.2 trillion cell, we get 52 plus trillion cell of voltage equivalent energy in one human being, the average human being. Now we can imagine, that's why when you close our eyes and think any space, we are fast, our mind goes faster than uh, the, the, the light, you know? You can actually concentrate on somebody, like sitting down, you can think of a sick person or someone in your family, you know, bring, when you, Imagine that person and start talking to that person. Don't be surprised that you might get a call in the next moment because you're connecting. So much is power with us, okay? Now, if 37.2 trillion cells need oxygen, the air that we breathe, why you? 
Bhagavan Vayu. Even if that one cell required pin tip of oxygen, imagine 37.2 trillion pin tips would be how much? So they say, Vedanta says that 8% of our body form constitutes of energy, 8 form constitutes of air or wind or oxygen for that matter. And it says on an average, 72% is near water. So Bhagavan translates into these five elements of planet Earth. So you can now imagine if we are all human beings are built from these five planets of, you know, five elements of planet, why are we so different from one to another? I have no answer to that, but let me continue my discussion. We are so egoist, you know, we think nature is out there to serve us. We don't feel we are a part of nature. So we are egocentric all the time. Uh, we think, you know, animals are for meat, a forest is for our wood, for our table, for chairs and destruction and things like that. We've been doing this, you know, for a long, long time. And this is the problem that we have created. This is the problem that we have created, not understanding that we are the part of them. You know, so we, our government, any government for that matter, functions with GDP or GNP or GNI, whatever you give the name, you know, gross national product. That's based on destruction of nature. The more you destroy society, you know, in terms of alcohol, I think there are 15,000 crore alcohol sold every month in India, multiply with a year how much million, uh, you know, crores of money. And that's all added to GDP. If there is brothel somewhere, the income from brothel is added to GDP. You know, destruction in a city like when the, the NCC was announced, there was a huge riot in Delhi and 1.2 billion worth of property was destroyed. That now to rebuild will add to GDP. So everything, whether we destroy a society or pump too much oil into our factories, industries, or, uh, you know, in our, um, uh, uh, what do you call, um, transport system, we spewing carbon so much into the atmosphere. And we all know that carbon spewing has direct relation with increase of, uh, you know, the uh, uh, temperature on the planet Earth. And we are bringing a catastrophe in our climate change. Now, if we remain e ecocentric, we, which means I accept I'm a part of the nature, every, or I'm in nature, in other words, and truly, if now let me tell you that fish, whether it's banana, you know, 70% of banana genes are in us, 88% of dog and cow genes are in us, 91% of frog genes are in us. That's why we constitute more water in our body form than, you know, than the other elements of the body. And I think we were born out of, um, out of water because much more relation in terms of genesis is with the water. All right. So even quarter of uh, rice genes are in us. You know, uh, you can name you can name a fruit fly gene. That little creature, forty six percent of its genes are in us. So how can we consider that we are separate from them? No, we cannot. Now, of course, the evolution theory of Christians it's Adam and Eve. Uh, in Islam, they said a pair of very good people and a pair of bad people. Uh, we are children from them. And if you hear. Uh, try to decode out of Hinduism and Buddhism, they say it was evolution of the nature or the universe, right? So no one has found out how we have been born, okay? But the truth is that we all connected. And when we are in nature, when you are with plants, with animals, our energy field increases and we tend to become happier naturally. This is an Indian scientist who just went around a bull uh, five times and his energy increased six times more than what he had. So his energy was felt at 19 meters. And when he went five times around the bull, his energy increased to 123 meters, six times more. So you see, that's why we become happier. And we can go into history of humankind. And we know that when there was a huge volcano eruption on planet, uh, you know, in Indonesia, the whole planet was ash covered. And during that time, they say, the total number of people that lived were 1,200. Today, we are 7.6 billion people on this planet Earth. We are from this very uh, amount of people. All right, 
So if we live in an ecocentric uh, way, I call that as the gross national happiness, then we have you know, beautiful planet for us and as well as for our children and their children and the generations after us. So this is the uh, one of the you know, uh, pages that I just drew from New Development Paradigm, which was submitted uh, to uh, UN General Assembly. Uh, final draft was submitted in uh, uh, February 2016 for uh, post-Millennium Development Goals. It was for the Sustainable Development Goals. So here we have a concept that the basic, and we must function within the planetary boundaries. We cannot go outside our planetary boundary. The moment we try to go out of our planetary boundary, we bring sufferings to our planet Earth, 100%. I was in, I mean, I was in, I'm in contact with young people all over the world. So I had some YPOs from the US. So I was talking about how could we do better on this planet Earth so that we can leave some, you know, same thing that we're enjoying today for our generations to come. And he said, why are you bothered about this? We will excavate moon, Mars, we'll get all the minerals from there when it's finished on earth. Let's destroy and continue our journey. That was a kind of perception he carried or they carried. So it's sad before you really change what is happening or try to help what's happening in your own homes, you are thinking of plundering others' homes. All right, anyway, so the concept that the GNH has that we submitted to UN is that there is a basic need and these needs cannot be compromised. These needs in whatever environment or spaces we live, this is required. And these are food. And we need to have adequate satisfaction of a life. So shelter is required, security is required, respect is required. And we need to realize that it is dependent. This kind of things are dependent only when the environment is sustainable. But if the environment is destroyed, what do you get out of it? Nothing. In a Marubhumi, we can't get anything. In a famine struck an area where there's no rain, we can't get anything. So the you know, environment has to sustain. Now, under this environment, we say that every government should prepare a holistic development approach with these four areas. Environment conservation, very important because environment is a part of us. Okay, Environment is very much a part of us. So we have to consider this. Sustainable, equitable, social, economic development, second one. Third one is preservation and promotion of culture. And the fourth one is good governance. If, if the agenda of the government is based on these four areas, then it enables us to use our resources properly, very responsibly, resources like natural, social, human, economic, and so forth, you know, for a sustainable future. When we do this, the outcomes are stunning. The outcome that will happen will be this, which we call the nine domains of happiness. Okay? With these nine domains, it has been proved scientifically, it has been known for in human history for a long time through experience and wisdom of great people that we can practice, we can cultivate happiness for ourselves. And then of course, we get into the tune of becoming a society of happiness, all right. So here is, sorry for running quickly, but uh, I don't have much time. So here is the nine, four pillars. The one that I told you, the development, um, you know, uh, uh, is this one that we call the, uh, uh, you know, the four pillars of gross national happiness, sustainable and equitable socioeconomic development, environment preservation, good governance, promotion and preservation of culture. Now you realize that these four pillars, these four pillars have their own domains. Sustainable and equitable socioeconomic has four domains. These are living standard, number one. Uh, number two is education. Number three is uh, health. Where is health? Health. So these are the three areas for number one. For environment, it is by itself a domain ecological diversity here by itself is a domain. Promotion of culture and, uh, uh, you know, promotion and preservation of culture, we have four domains. Time use, one. Cultural diversity, two. Community vitality, three. 
and one more psychological well-being. These come under promotion and preservation of culture. So good governance is by itself here. So if you see two important ones, the ecological diversity resilience, which corresponds with environment preservation, good governance by good governance. They, they are so important because without good governance, it's linking, you know, all linking through all the processes here, all the domains here. Now you see these are nine domains and each domain have their indicators. So for example, psychological well-being has life satisfaction, positive and negative emotions and spirituality, four domains. And uh, likewise, time use has three, but the third one is not spelled out, work, sleep, and of course your home chores and other things. Okay? Um, just to give you an example, a quick example of how time was used, a study done by um, US, they found out that 28.5 years of their life, they are sleeping only. 10 years of their life, they are earning only. It could be more in India and less sleep, more work here. Nine, nine years of their life, they're busy behind social media. Another nine years of life, they're busy with home chores and other things, eating, drinking, and all that. No, eating, drinking, another four years they have added. Six years of their lifespan, they spend only in educating and self-grooming. They spend two years in shopping of their lifetime, which is of an average of 78 years, and two years they are commuting. Then they only spend 1.5 years for looking after or for rearing children. And the total, they are reaching almost 69 years of their total 78 years. By then their, their total life left is nine years. By then they are old, they have struggled so hard to earn this money. Now, what they want is to live well and satisfy for the last part of nine years. And they begin to struggle and spend all their savings running behind doctor, having medication and all that. My dear friends out there, it's not necessary to do that. I'm 65 years old and I feel myself very healthy, touch wood, I don't depend on any medication. It's all to do with how we eat, how we sustain ourselves, how we understand our own being. So I wish I could talk, speak on each one of them, but I don't have time, so let me continue. And we can you know, re uh, relate with India as well, with 72 years of life expectancy in India. Okay. So what is the way to happiness? Like Buddha said, the way to happiness is happiness is the way. But what is the seed of happiness? Let's try to look into this a little bit. Okay, Mindfulness. The seed of happiness is mindfulness. Now let us see what does mindfulness mean. Mindfulness is not to be, to, uh, not to live in the uh, forgetfulness, not to live in the past, forgetfulness stands for living in the past or in the future. If you live in the past, we use last part of our mind, 47% of our mind, we are using for either to be in the past or to be in the future. Our research tells us. So mindfulness is not meditation. There is a difference between mindfulness and meditation. But if you're mindful, you are always meditating. That's the beauty of mindfulness. And what does mindfulness mean? Mindfulness means it is to be present. Present doesn't mean we often we can hear to be here and now, present here and now. No, it simply means to be completely aware of your present self. Where are you? How are you breathing? What are you doing? Even if you're washing pot or pan, you, your mind should be floating there. And of course, women have 30% more connectivity between the cognitive and the emotional brain, left and the right brain, and uh, uh, they, they can multitask. But what I'm trying to say is that even in that multitasking, if they're in all of that, fully in those, they are mindful. So being mindful is to be completely aware of your presence and not think you're walking through somewhere, but your mind is elsewhere, you know, 
But if you're enjoying the walk, every step you're feeling that you're pushing on the ground, you're seeing things as you move along, that is mindfulness, okay? Mindfulness increases our conscious mind. Remember I talked about what Dr. Bruce Lipton talked about, that we have you know, so much information in our subconscious and they are good and bad. Now to eliminate the bad, we need to rewrite. And to rewrite, we need to find verses, uh, beautiful chanting mantras or some kind of prayers or some kind of you know practices just to overcome rewrite our consciousness the more we rewrite our conscious and be totally present in what we are doing consciously we are increasing our conscious mind and somewhere they say that if your conscious mind can be increased to 16 percent or 20 percent you would not be you can become anything at that point of time you see, so the total amount of our conscious mind that we use, they say, science says is 5%. Mindfulness is not about calming the mind. There's a misunderstanding. There's a billion dollar industry in the West on mindfulness. And they will tell you, be aware of your breathing in and breathing out. Now, when they say aware, they're saying, make your mind the subject and your breath the object. And be aware, be conscious how the breath is entering. What are the feelings that it's bringing to your body? You know, your stomach is rising, your chest is expanding as you breathe on, out, or exhale from the nose. You know, you, you feel the air leaving, your stomach falling, your chest reducing. See, this feeling you need to be aware of. Um, it will always make us glorious, you know. Once our mind is free, that means mind free. We say control your mind. It's wrong. We need to free our mind. Simply when you have, it means that when you don't live in the past or in the future, then you are free. Okay. When you when you control your mind, you are there with so many other things. So you're not free. All right. So mindfulness helps us to be to do right kritya, right karma. So you know it's between. Um, our conscious and unconscious mind, whatever we do, you know, sometimes somebody says something and we get angry and we react immediately. But there is a space between that two, and that's your right uh, kritya. There's a small, the pause, if you can realize that pause and say, okay, hold, hold on before I say something, you will always make yourself a greater human being on the planet Earth. And with this practice, mindfulness, actually, we will understand so much because we will awaken our awareness that we will begin to live in interdependence. And then what happens is the um, uh, enlightenment is not far away. All right, so we live in ignorance. We need to eliminate our ignorance. And some of the practices that can eliminate our ignorance, I'll not go into that depth because I have no time. Wisdom, what does, how does wisdom come to us? It's with the right understanding of things and right thoughts in your mind. With those, you can achieve, you can inculcate, you can cultivate wisdom. Okay, I'll not explain that. Second one is morality. What is morality? It has three components again. Morality has samyak vachan, meaning right speech. When you speak well, Definitely, you're creating a better environment wherever you are. Okay? So deep listening and loving speech is so very important. Action, karma. What actions are you doing? How does it help you and others? You have to consider others as well. If it only helps you and doesn't help others, you know, then there is something wrong in the karma. It needs to be with you. But it doesn't mean that you give your life for others. That's not karma too. You need to take care that whatever you do should not harm you and should not harm others. Azivika, which means right livelihood. You know, all animals want to live, but we eat them. You know, they fear death like we do, but they can't speak. And the more we eat meat, there's heavier growth of meat industry. The more we have uh, dairy products, the more is the uh, dairy industry. And the more packed food we eat, the more is the factory producing, you know? So right livelihood, meaning that by participating in that, we are destroying our planet Earth in many ways. 
I wish I had more time to explain you how, but look at the connection, just one connection. You know, like buying clothes. I have money, I, anywhere I go, I buy. And what do I do? I have a closet full of clothes. Hardly I use any one of them. The more I buy, the more factory will produce. The more factory produce, they will pressurize the cotton growers to grow more. You can also link this way for meat and dairy industry. And what happens? The cotton growing, 80% of the cotton is chemically or genetically modified cotton. That requires much more input of uh, you know, chemical fertilizers to grow them. Now, when that happens, chemical fertilizers to grow them, when that happens, of course, definitely you're killing the soil. When the soil is dead, it doesn't have the water retention power. And then the groundwater is reducing in a very fast speed today. So, you know, whatever we do has direct implication to our planet Earth because we are not here. We can't do anything for the nature. But nature does everything for us. We cannot live without them, but they can live without us. That is the difference. So we need to be very mindful about what we are eating. All right. The last one is practice, I call, or habit, or concentration. What does this concentration lead us to? One is samyak vam, right efforts. We need to bring right efforts. What is that right effort? So if you have right intention and right efforts, you'll always do right in life. Okay? Smriti, mindfulness. We need to be mindful. I'll talk a little more on this. Samadhi, concentration, meditation, meditation. So these are the practices for us to be concentrated, to bring concentration or to make it as a habit for a better life and living. So Samya, Smriti or right mindfulness, what does it have? There are five steps to it. Step number one is mindful breathing. All you do is listen to your breathing. Of course, when you're listening to your breathing, it's like in the early times when you're learning how to cycle, you fall, you again try, you fall, and after a while you get it. And now you just climb on it and go to the destination you want, uh, singing a song or talking to a friend or singing around. You, know, you don't have to think, how do I stay and all that. Mindfulness, exactly, breathing has the same problem. In the beginning, it takes you, your mind begins to wander and float away. But you gently invite the mind to come back to breathing in, be aware of breath. How is the breath entering? What are the feelings that are arising in your body? And when you breathe out, the same thing, you know, be aware of your breath out, but your mind should be, you know, together with the breath and you should be aware of how your body is, you know, feeling as you're breathing out. Once you have a, this practice for about five minutes when you can constantly concentrate without floating away, then you can start to put verses that you'd like to see the world or the people would see you the way you want them to see. For example, breathing in, you can put the mind, I'm very calm. Breathing out, I put a smile on my face. So breathe in, calm mind, calm. You put the word calm. And you know what it translates to? The mind, I'm calm. Breathing out, I smile. Now, when you practice this, for many, many hours together, over time, you, everyone will see you as very calm and smiling all the time. This is the beauty of mindful breathing. All right, then the focus or our concentration, or the West calls is attending with attention. How do you get that? To get that, you can do visualization, you can do gazing, you can do sound, you can do music, you can do laughter, you can do mantras, chanting, you can do prayers. But remember, if you don't know what the meaning of the chanting is, the effect that you get is way less than the, uh, you know the meaning of it. Okay? So you need to know the meaning of it. Uh, whatever you're chanting, it should be very much known to you. If it is not known to you, then the effect is less. Same with prayers. If you like a mantra very much, but you don't know the meaning of it, try to give a meaning the way that you want to see the world, okay? It's okay, this, you know, everybody, all the great people in, on planet Earth, whoever found these mantras have given meaning to it. Okay? So you can create your own mantra and give a meaning, a beautiful meaning and rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and you be, become that. Like a young child, you know, a destitute child is brainwashed 
by saying something and it's all written in the subconscious. So the child just ties a home around goes uh, and knows that I have to kill as many as to get into heaven or somewhere to meet my parents or enjoy my life. Uh, you know, that's, that's what he or she believes and they just go and blast themselves. See, this is all to do how you can rewrite your subconscious that you will believe always. Okay, many ways to do it. I wish I could take you through some practice, but uh, like I said, no time. Awareness of body. Every time you are in an office or somewhere, try to be aware of your body. When you sit on the chair, feel how your bottom is sitting, how your legs are grounding, how your toes are, how are you feeling with your, you know, uh, your uh, soles of your feet, your calf muscles, your knees. Ask every part of the body to calm and relax. Okay, just say calm and relax. And if you can give attribute to them, like saying, "Oh, great soul." You have been standing for me since the time I began to walk on you. Thank you so much for being there for me. You know, please relax. Please be comfortable. You know, that way you can talk to your body up to the head. This is awareness of the body. For those of you who have insomnia, on the bed, what you can do is you can lie down and start, you know, wriggling your toes and start talking the toes, attributing. And after you finish attributing, say, be calm and peaceful or be calm and relax. And the next word you bring out is, my eyes are getting heavier, I'm falling asleep. Come to the soul, come to the ankle, come to the heels, come to your calf muscle, to knee, okay. and that way. But to everyone, you try to give you know, an attribute and say thank you and ask that part to be calm and relaxed, okay? And then the last word you use is, my eyes are getting heavier, I'm falling asleep. I promise you, the quality of your sleep when you get into sleep will be wonderful. You'll come awake the following morning with great, great amount of uh, energy within you. Okay, so many ways to do this awareness of body, releasing tension. Sometimes we get stuck in a traffic and we get very jittery and angry. But there's a very simple way. You know? Take a deep breath and say, "Thank you, universe, for giving me this opportunity for me to connect myself with my body." You know, don't feel fetter. Oh, if I was one second early, I could have crossed this traffic. No point. The universe has given you a chance to connect. Connect with yourself. Or if you're in high tension, just take a deep breath in hard, you know, three times. You have a calming effect immediately. If you're angry suddenly and you're not able to control, do the same. But be aware and try to control your anger. Because what comes out of your anger will never be you know, forgiven by anybody. Sometimes it can be very bad for ourselves because it goes as a bullet out of us. Releasing tension, also, if you're getting into some interview or something, take some deep breaths. When you go in, just relax, close your eyes, take deep breath in. You'll feel very relaxed. This is mindful walking. Mindful walking, what you do is you kind of, when you walk, feel the step and try to see, be aware of, what you pass by without judgment, don't judge. You see a beautiful flower, enjoy it as a beautiful flower. Don't say how beautiful that flower is. If I could pick it up, no. Or how does it smell? You know, don't start to take your mind away. Just be there as you walk with awareness and as you see. There's a beautiful, um, you know, oriental um, way of um, stress management. You know, it's a uh, Japanese, they've been doing for centuries. If you worry too much, this thumb, you hold it for two minutes with much pressure on the tip, you know, two minutes. If you fear, hold this finger. If you are angry, hold this finger. Two minutes, two minutes, but put pressure on the tip. If you are sad, hold this finger. And if you're lonely, hold this finger, okay, for two minutes each. One of the Emotions, but if you have multiple emotion, anxiety is a multiple emotion. Then what you do is press in the center of your palm with other thumb and just recite there for two minutes. All the tips of these fingers are connected to the brain. And that is why you get a calming effect because you're sensing now, uh, sending the senses to the brain. Please try. I, I don't know if it works, but please try. Now, here is the mantra. One last, this is the last slide, a quick one that will be over, I suppose. Um, 
karma will never spare us. What we do will come back to us. It's cause and effect. You know, this is right. All right, you see the picture of karma. Okay, nice way presented. My mantra, this is my mantra. But please go with this and I promise you will all be happy. Be present in every moment and conduct yourself with loving speech. Don't try to compare yourself or compete with somebody. Compete with yourself. See what you did yesterday. How can you do it today better? Put a resolve. Do a little meditation when you get up in the morning. You know? Forgive yourself and others. If you don't, you will always remain you know, with something covering your 47 part percent of your brain is all something that is not useful. So part of this is when you have done something wrong onto others, you might feel guilty. When someone has done something wrong to you, you might want to revenge and you're preparing for all that. You see how much energy and resource you'll be using. So learn to forgive. And the moment you forgive, you'll calm down. And this message of forgiveness will also reach to the person. I tell you, I promise you. See positive in everyone. Our human character is we see negative in everybody. But everybody has a positive side. And if you can cultivate that positive side, you'll make that person a better human being. Have right intentions and right efforts and forget about what comes. If, if you had right intentions and right efforts and that thing didn't come, don't worry. Universe has something else in plan for you, okay? Just, just accept it and let it go. Like acceptance is already very high. And uh, after that is, you know, love. When you start to vibrate, your energy starts to vibrate. If at 500 uh, hertz in frequency per second, you are naturally, as the quantum physics says, you're all naturally in love, which means that everything you love, any human being that you cross will be in love. Okay? And if you cross love, 540 hertz, you are already in joy, complete joy. When you are in 600, you are in peace. And when you cross 700, you are enlightened. See, this is what Michio Kaku, the father of the string theory talks about. He says, if we know the vibration of dinosaurs and can't vibrate, because we have so much energy, we vibrate at the same level like them, we'll feel and see them around us. That's what he said, okay? So we have to learn to live in harmony with the nature and serve others, very important, and, and be grateful all the time because anything we use, everything around us, if we are not grateful, we will never be a better human being in life. Send loving kindness to self and others. You can close your eyes and bring a person, say, be well, be happy, may you be successful. Even person who is jealous of you, who is angry of you, just think of that person and send happiness. You will change that person because that person will feel. And as I explained to you, we carry so much energy, you know, so much energy with us. It will reach to them. Keep mission statement, self-affirmation. When you see in the mirror, what do you see yourself? You see your beautiful face? No. Try to reaffirm that person you see in the mirror. Say you are a unique person. You are a beautiful human being. You will be very you know, satisfied in life. You will be always helping others. You will leave better footprints on this planet Earth. You will be able to vibrate with the universe in their frequency. I found to that person that you see in the mirror, not what you see, how good you look. No, don't be fooled in your self-image. Don't try to get validation from others, how I look today. Be yourself, be yourself. I promise you, you will find life much more beautiful. Try to balance your life with a time of eight hours to sleep, eight hours to work, and eight hours for home chores, eating, drinking, listening to uplifting music for 10, 20 minutes, reading inspirational books for 10, 20, half an hour, 30 minutes of sweating exercise, quality time with family, that's another eight hours. So if you can balance your life in this eight, 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 I promise you, you will always create a happier self. Create habits from waking to uh, from waking up to the sleeping time. Like I said, when you wake up, the first thing you should do is push yourself against the bedpost. Think what you did yesterday and think what will you do today and how will you do it better than yesterday and put a result. Today, I'll be calm and peaceful. So if you put a result every day like this, what happens after a while? Anything senses 
you have that space to think, no, no, I shouldn't get angry. I should not be frustrated. You know, I should accept it. Then only I can take the next, next step. So, and then you could, you know, then you sit down and do a meditation, mindful meditation of few minutes, you know, three minutes to six minutes. Then lie down on the bed, stretch fully, do a cyclic kick as many times as you do. When you touch the ground, say, thank you, Mother Earth, for giving me the opportunity to walk on it today. You know, today when you wake up, there are millions who will never wake up in, our life, in their lives. You know? So we need to be grateful. And after that, probably you'll head towards the bathroom. You see yourself in the mirror, put an affirmation, put your list of affirmation there and read it out to that person that you see in the mirror, all right? With this, I'll end my uh, presentation. And please remember that we need to do 30 minutes of sweating exercise. You need to have nourishing food, don't eat meat and dairy products. They are both cancerous and diabetic. It has been proven by scientists all over the world. You can Google and read for yourself. And sleep eight hours, very important. Because if you sleep well eight hours, the tip of the telomere, it's a Blackburn, Dr. Blackburn, who did 30 years of study to prove that the tip of the telomeres get cancerous if you sleep less than six hours. And six hours is not adequate also. But sometimes it's all right. But try to sleep more than seven hours. Or if you have deep sleep, between six and seven hours is good. But eight hours is a must. And they get cancerous. And what happens is you begin to slow down. You begin to age faster and you also pass away faster. But if you meditate and remain mindful, my friends, this is what she has proven that your telomeres will become longer. You live longer and you'll be happier through your life. So I believe every day is beautiful. Even though we know our last destination, the final ultimate destination, take it every moment, take it slowly, being fully present in what you do. With this, I'll end my presentation, but let me wish you Tashi Dilek. In Bhutan, it means may all the auspiciousness come to you. And I send you my loving kindness. May you be all well and happy. May you find happiness in what you do. May you bring happiness to the lives that you touch. May you be the light for yourself, your family, your friends, your community, your country, and the world. Please give me a second. Let me sing this happiness song for you. And this song is not for the body. It's for the mind. I adapted from a longer version of Master Tignat Han. He's a great Jain Buddhist master. So let me just sing this. And with this, I'll end. Happiness is here and now. I have dropped my worry. Nowhere to go, nothing to do, and I'm not in a hurry. Happiness is here and now. I have dropped my worries. Somewhere to go, something to do. But I'm not in a hurry. Thank you so much. Thank you. All my blessings to you. Thank you. Sorry for taking a longer time. Thank you. Tashi Dilek. Tashi Dilek. Tashi Dilek, Professor Chetty. I am not in a hurry. So it is in that spirit. I invite Minati now to make her presentation. I would come a little later. Minati. Hello. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So let me share my screen. If I cannot, you have to help me out. So hello and good evening, everyone. So hello, Professor Chetri. Hello, Anantabhai, Randir, and everyone present here. I am not a very expert in happiness or so. So few things only I have gathered from my experience and uh, how we, I practice it my, in my day-to-day -day life. So those things only I'm going to share. I'm not able to share my screen. Just a minute. Is it uh, visible there? Uh, 
no it is not visible if you are facing problem then i can share on your yeah please please okay Yes. Now I think, yeah. So I have kept the title of my title of my presentation is understanding happiness and well-being. Actually, it is the basic level of understanding these things a little more nowadays. So can we go to next slide? Yes. I cannot see that. If you can kindly make the screen full. Would be wonderful. Yeah, this is. So, as we all say, I mean, and that is a famous quote like, happiness is a conscious choice, not, at a, not an automatic response. Actually, to be happy, we have to, I mean, consciously choose. I mean, one must be mindful and self aware. So um, I read one article before few days, actually mindfulness uh, can improve the cognition in children, in elderly people, in uh, all the human beings. So I just added that one in my presentation that is actually mindfulness based programs are being used to improve the mental health and well-being. So findings suggest it has small but very significant benefit to the cognition. That is that Professor Tim Whitefield. So, yeah, so yeah, studies yeah. studies prove that 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 definition there is a definite correlation between the happiness and the active lifestyle and in the self image and the emotional and heart health. Okay. No, he's here. And it will, it will have, we will have, as Professor Chetri explained all these things. I feel very, I mean, there is nothing more to explain. I can only explain my personal experiences. I mean, that and the third slide, I have put that. So that one. So then it, it gives us the good health and that faster recovery. In this faster recovery, this point, I can say, this I have experienced in my own life and um, how it that positivity and that uh, mindfulness that has helped us to come out of a traumatic situation. And that as everybody knows, that is longevity and improve the quality of life can happen with happiness. And the fourth point is higher positivity and improved productivity. And we know in this corporate culture now, everybody is adopting that happiness uh, color, and happiness environment to their offices to just to increase the productivity and uh, uh, to means you know, keep the all the employees in their um, mental health emotional health they should remain healthy so they are adopting all these uh, happiness uh, for productivity then success is success in business and career as a, we all know, it is very obvious. If you will be happy, you will be more productive and you will be very successful in your uh, business and career. And the fourth, at the last point is better relationship with people and ourselves. If once somebody is happy, you can have a happier relationship with your family, with your friends, with your colleagues, with everyone around. So that is very much important. I as the relationship at the base of any social life or personal life. So that um, that can be a very important point. Can we go to the next slide? This yeah. And in my small way, actually I've written how to achieve happiness. The first thing I feel that uh, achieving happiness is we should stop racing. Once you, we start racing, no, we forget our own journey. Our aim becomes only to uh, like you know, how we will come first, not that enjoying our own journey. We just concentrate at the destination, not uh, enjoying our own journey. You can take an example of two people driving a car. Like if you start racing, 
your aim will be like how we will reach faster than them not that who is there in the car what we were doing listening to music or how our journey was we forget completely about that so that becomes a tense tense to moment more than the happiness so the first point is you should stop racing so then enjoy your own journey whatever the journey may be and whatever way it is we should enjoy each and every moment so that we will you know like you know comparing with others and whatever is meant for us or whatever way it is we can have our own journey then the third point is remain stable in compliments and in criticism i have given it is as a pendulum effect like now if somebody says something good about us or compliment us i mean we should not take it so much uh, no it is they are talking about us we should tell like that they are nice people so they are telling these things about me so that is the same way we can take the negative comments the criticism okay they are telling something what they felt we should not take it upon us so if we will be it is pendulum effect in this way like if you are oscillated the pendulum oscillates towards the negative and positive both the side if you are affected by positive comments we will be affected definitely affected by the negative comments so we will try to keep it stable so that we can do and uh, we can achieve happiness by way, being very close to nature which is we can love nature we can enjoy the music we want and be active and learn and the, the fifth point is to learn some new skills and take up a new hobby always know the research says when you uh, learn a new skill there is a hormone get secreted from the brain and we feel a sense of happiness a sense of achievement that you have learned a new skill and you have adopted a new hobby so that every time we can challenge or push little bit towards in the positive way to achieve the achieve that and in that way we will get happy and spread happiness around and starting with the family and friends so that uh, the previous point i said no that like if you are happy you will keep your family your surroundings everything happy so that that will if everyone is happy that good vibration will happen so every that will remain the atmosphere will be happy above all smile and they say if you smile instantly you start feeling happy so there are few flip side to trying to be happier i mean i don't have answer probably professor chetri will have the answers but as a psychological point of view i have written down few flip side of uh, happiness trying to be happy that is no a forced positivity can can be toxic sometimes i mean no if somebody dies somebody's house you cannot tell them it's okay if people die like things you should give them time to grieve to get over through that if you are uh, forcing the toxic positivity that means we are denying our emotions and we cannot tell like uh, always stay positive only give the positive vibes uh, it could have been the worst if something happened it could have been the worst that means you no know, if you tell stay positive everybody is not capable of being staying positive all the time that means we are undermining their um, condition their emotional condition so and the happiness is a choice is still a controversial subject for me i mean i said that initially but that uh, happiness nobody wants to be sad anyway but if given the choice somebody can adopt it very easily to be happy and they can switch on from sadness to happiness some cannot what can be done in those cases and um, sometimes you say failure is not an option and you wait you will get over it and everything happens for a reason like uh, those things no rejects a personal uh, in a from a psychological point of view no it means if you tell like this people suddenly switch off they don't they think that we are not ready to listen to them and uh, things like that and one more thing some people say if i can do it then you can also do that everybody doesn't have the same skills 
what i can do easily probably the other person find it very difficult so these are the flip sides i think we can discuss the next slide this is actually exclusively uh, yeah Pinati, i request you to uh, Ah uh, yeah yeah I'll, I'll just wind up for two minutes yeah in, so in then, one or two minutes please eh? yeah, yeah, yeah 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 so that uh, this is actually this slide is it exclusively my personal uh, um, slide I can tell I I had written one article published in Times of India Soul Kori my article a step towards inner journey so inward journey so that one i had written after my husband met with a traumatic accident and he had some complex surgeries in that time how did we all i mean i and he both we remain positive and did things so that one actually i had written in that so that i'll just read these things and tell one one sentence about this get over yourself and accept the reality and the situation in that is in first i allowed myself to grieve for one or two days then i become stronger and took the decisions so then i surrounded surround yourself with the family and friends for emotional that uh, i did actually a little bit weaker and crying and all i kept away from them so that i don't become full about your struggle that actually you no know, a lot of uh, um, means it gives it uh, you, once you share your worries it reduces the worries actually then meditate and connect with something that is larger than life that means it i just did not concentrate on our problem i just saw also other people's problem i appreciated small things what other in and around then evaluate the options available so that is um, something about medical things and listen to the spiritual role in my life to remain positive every day i mean every day we used to listen to shlokas and some soothing music so these were the then we think we thought positive then we always visualize the light at the end of the tunnel so that was the that was the thing and these are some facts only i have gathered like happiness chemicals and how to activate them so i i hope that everyone is able to see the screen so these are the things actually i have written there are four types of dopamine oxytocin then and i am not able to see this so okay minati so th these are the things actually i did so i yeah yeah thank yeah thank you this this is what is my presentation about so thank you thanks for the opportunity thank you minati so dear friends we have had two presentations now randi you can also kindly make your presentation yes. i would come at the end yes uh thank you so much sir and thank you so much uh, dr chetri for a thought provoking presentation and uh, usually uh, there is a approach in psychology called biopsychosocial approach and you incorporated another dimension that is biopsycho a spiritual <laughs> connotation so thank you so much for your uh, good pre presentation and excellent presentation uh, being a teacher um, of sociology and social psychology uh my focus on uh the psychological sense of happiness uh for me happiness is a social construct yet it is sometimes objected against such claim that uh, like satisfaction cannot suffice for happiness because other things like achievement like knowledge like wisdom like morality you know matter for human well being L. W. Sumner, you know, identifies well-being with uh, he termed authentic happiness. Happiness that is authentic, authentic in the sense of being both informed and autonomous. Then we have some philosophical insights like Aristotle, Stoic accounts, and there we can find a clear uh, that happiness alone. 
does not uh, suffice with well-being and that its significance is not what common opinion takes it to be and uh, that some kind of happiness can be worthless or even bad for that matter so that is why you know uh, we can see that most philosopher regards uh, happiness as secondary to morality in a uh, good life uh, i think some disruption is there okay yes uh, uh, then we have uh, you know a two a differentiation in terms of visualizing happiness we have western uh, conception a kind of hedonism or a kind of uh, utilitarianism oriented that or, or a kind of orientation that is to seek pleasure and avoid pain we have another kind of interpretation of happiness given by lord buddha you know uh, uh, on happiness he recognizes that painful and unpleasant experiences are a natural part of uh, our human condition and uh, which should be embraced uh, rather than to avoid so buddha you know uh, show happiness and suffering uh, as cyclical influence each other then we have uh, in modern sense we have some kind of differentiation in terms of uh, interpretation of happiness of uh, so far as the perspective of gandhi amrit sen john rawls you know insights is concerned they visualize happiness you know or uh, in other word happiness must be understood in context of justice uh, in this view we do not have uh, a right to be happy rather justice demands only that each of us uh, uh, has each has you know sufficient opportunity in terms of capabilities in terms of resources to achieve a good life or that each gets a fair share on benefits of uh, social cooperation uh, well being you know we have the if you see the um, topic that is happiness well being and anand well being as a value fulfillment you know how we can uh, we can help each other to live well right so uh, well being has a you know more connotation on uh, society than the self uh, since we have limitation of time uh, so uh, you know although uh, dr chatri has you know already highlighted some of the Uh, mantras uh, of happiness uh, but i have also some uh, you know understanding uh, so let me talk about some methods of happiness you know if you see the human condition you know particularly feeling or uh, emotion like fear frustration anger jealousness you know all of those negative emotions uh, they are uh, not going not uh, you know going away uh, you need to give them a kind of space a space and one technique that is used is meditation or sadhana where you uh, really try to recognize and accept those emotions and you should recognize you should investigate you should accept for that matter you have to nurture yourself that is you know here uh, we we can bring maslow's theory of self actualization and self realization another thing that uh, is a kind of constraint of happiness is uh, ideology is a kind of judgmental self uh, you know conceived uh, con con conceptualized by chris murthy and osho you know mindful people might be happier because Uh, they cultivate non-judgmental awareness of their thought, which allows them to better understand what they are. Even new new psychological uh, research, you know, find this fact, and very clearly uh, said, like you, you know, students who were more non-judgmental 
about their thoughts, about their feeling, tended to report uh, a particular clear sense of, you know, self. Uh, who are less judgmental about their thoughts and feeling are happier because they have better idea of who they are. I was reading some uh, psychological, social psychological interpretation of happiness. Uh, I find, uh, found some research on Dutch and Finland, uh, a country who are you know, top on uh, happiness index. You know, there with a strong culture of volunteerism, you know, high standard of living, uh, they cherish high standard of living in terms of, you know, action and ra rather unique business culture. So cultivation of an environment of emotional well-being throughout the personal self, that is the understanding that we can draw. Then we have to be little optimistic, little acceptable. You know, happiness is not uh, about denying uh, that uh, you have problems. You even denial of, uh, of a, a fasting soul is not productive. When troubles happen, we need to address them. When there is stress, we need to do something about it. So problem solving is a necessary part of being happiness. Even if it is written in Bible that there is a time for joy and there is a time to mourn. But mourning is a short, uh, short term process, not a lifetime, right? Uh, so another uh, thing that we can uh, uh, talk about here is happiness is a, it's as happy things. You know, your mood matter for that matter. You know, your attitude towards daily life events helps determine your mood. A famous social psychologist, James Allen, you know, he said uh, that uh, you, you are today where your thoughts brought you. You will be tomorrow where your thoughts take you. The right tools of positive thought are needed to do this job. So we have to have a kind of happiness toolkit. Uh, another thing uh, that uh, uh, is um, important to discuss, there is a uh, social psychologist called Peterson and Seligman. They identified six virtues and uh, 24 character strengths that happy people constantly reported the wider world over. They called these skills uh, a signature strength, signature strength. And much of happiness is associated with uh, keeping a positive state of mind and connecting with others in loving relations. Sligman says uh, uh, the definition of character strength uh, is it contributes to fulfillment. It contributes to a strength of heart that is just, that is gratitude, that is hope, that is love, are most robustly associated with life satisfaction uh, than are more uh, cerebral strengths such as curiosity or uh, love of learning, uh, right? So, uh, you know, in that sense, uh, we have to, uh, you know, social psychologically, uh, you know, interpret happiness in context of uh, society. If you uh, try to understand, you know, happiness in larger sense, better sense for that matter. And, and ultimately, you know, the solution comes with, uh, uh, you know, your belief, your belief change. Uh, if your belief is dynamic, then you can determine more happiness. And, and little things uh, mean a lot when you done with love, right? So this sort of thing, uh, I have another thing to say, but since we have, uh, uh, you know, lack of time. So uh, one thing that I want to say means if you are a happy person, then you have to have a kind of uh, potential. And that potential is willing to change, means the willing, 
to change one's mind due to understanding of new fact is priceless. And that is a way, one of the significant way to achieve and actualize more happiness. Thank you so much. Thank you, Randeep. <laughs> you are becoming a wise, <laughs> wise traveler of word and knowledge, becoming a murib, you know, peer and murib, you know, <laughs> becoming a guru. That's lovely, dear Randeep. So, dear friends, co present. We, are, we already have been enriched by Professor Catherine, Minati, and Randi. And each one of them, they have come to us as a jewel, as a beautiful flower of thinking and quest. Though we have been with some time, I request your generosity to also join me in sharing some thoughts about this. Now, I will use the share screen option. I would like to begin this conversation, which I entitled Happiness, Wellbeing, and Ananda, New Visions and Pathways of Self-Development, Friendship with Others, Social Transformations, and Planetary Realizations. Beginning with this poem from uh, Wordsworth, my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began. So is it now I am a man. So be it when I grow old or let me die. The child is the father of men. And I, I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. So piety is a foundation of happiness. Then the next line is from Desmond Tutu, who is saying that the whole African conception of Ubuntu, what is Ubuntu, it means that I am happy, you are happy. I am well, if you are well. So happiness is linked to relations as Minati was saying, and that also draws inspiration from Ubuntu, this tradition of thinking from Africa. Then we come to Wittgenstein, the great philosopher, who is saying, the planet can suffer no greater torment than a single man. So if each one of us is in torment, then the whole planet is on fire. Therefore, each one of us have a duty to try to be kind to ourselves, overcoming our planet, kind to the other, and contributing to the well-being of the planet. Rudolf Steiner, a great spiritual seeker, is also saying that how society will then become what young people as all human beings make out of the existing social condition. The new generation should not just be made to be what present society wants it to become. So therefore, a sense of adventure. Happiness is not just status quo. And then uh, happiness and human development. We know that the whole happiness comes in a way critique of existing models of human development, like gross domestic product, we have it, gross national happiness. But what is the problem with existing thinking about development is that development is mainly considered in economic and political terms. And it constitutes a black box. According to Professor Fred Dalmeyer, it is an enlightenment black box. That is the whole enlightenment tradition in Europe. It cuts us away from nature and divine. But human development and human uh, happiness must include human nature and divine. 
Human development, according to Amartya Sen, includes function. We need to function. But as we function, we can be attentive to the pathways of happiness as already cultivated by our three friends and capability. To capability, we become capable. To become one aspect of capability is creativity. And how we become creative and happy in such a way that our capability becomes a dance of creativity and happiness. Development as freedom, but freedom also is responsibility. Development is self-knowledge and mutual knowledge. In fact, happiness comes from authentic and a striving self-knowledge, am I? Now, for example, to begin with that I have a definition, I have a uh, definition that I'm a wife. But this is a given definition, I am a wife. At the same time, I am a sadhika, for example. Who am I? Who is my husband? Is only my husband? Or my husband is also a, 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 a dance of striving for light, for example. So to have that sense, I give this story from uh, Maitreyi and Jagya Malkia that Amartya Sen writes about in his book, Development as Freedom. You know that story, <laughs> often talked about that Jagya Malkia was leaving the house and Maitreyi asked him, Maitreyi gave him a, a, a lemonade, you know, she had prepared a beautiful lemonade and gave and said, where are you going? I am going in search of uh, immortality. Then she asked, what I am going to do here? And Maitre remarks, and then she asked, I am going to milk the cow and get a lot of money, then would it make me immortal? Then Jagyavalki was true. She said, no, like the life of rich people will be your life, but there is no hope of immortality by wealth. Maitre remarks, what should I do with that by which I do not become immortal? So what is the meaning of immortality? So to our conversation, I want to bring the discourse of happiness, not just to momentariness. Happiness is not just momentary. You give me a chocolate, I become happy. You smile, I become happy. When you put all your anger against me, then I cry. I think that, oh, Divine Mother helped me. So happiness goes through this. Sir, you are muted, kindly unmute yourself. Ah. Yes. So with all these moments, how do we become, how to cultivate eternal, something beyond the momentary? So that idea of mortality and immortality. And here, Amartya Sen says that this whole quest for immortality, we would have to translate it also into visible terms. For example, child mortality. Now, because of lack of milk, for example, or lack of nutrition, now, uh, Professor Ketri was referring to Abhimanyu. Think of if Suhadra didn't have any food to eat, then what would the ability of Abhimanyu to listen to that wisdom would be very limited. So as much as we create conditions for life and flourishing of life, for example, giving milk to pregnant mothers, giving them beautiful food, dancing with them, these are small acts of creation of immortality. I have a poem where I write, how can we cultivate immortality? So happiness is linked to that movement of creation of immortality in a very small way. Like the, if I can, if somebody is very distressed, if I can be with her and help us for a moment, that moment is a creation of immortality. Mrityo mang amrutam gamaya. Mrityo mang amrutam gamaya is a day-to-day journey. It's a moment-to-moment -moment journey. It is in that spirit, Sri Aurobindo also, in his thoughts and aphorism, Sri Aurobindo also says that there are very different kinds of immortality. So, so he writes there are lesser and larger eternities for eternity is a term of the soul and can exist in time as well as exceedingly. And here we can also remember the journey of Sabitri. 
you know, through this discourse of happiness, we can read Sri Aurobindo's Sahitri as a journey to happiness and immortality. We have already heard that how gross national happiness from Bhutan, Professor Chetri has always told us, it is, it is not just happiness. It includes everything, psychological well-being, time use, community vitality, culture, health, education, living standards, and governance. For example, if the existing power structure is so killing, then it is very difficult to be happy you know, if the existing governance system is based upon destruction of human dignity, then it is very, uh, it is not that easy to be happy. Of course, happiness is a choice. I always give an example. Now, if you go to England, you buy a train ticket from England, say London to Edinburgh, and you have already purchased the ticket and the train is leaving at 6, 10 p.m or 6, 10 a.m. Now, if you just miss that train, the whole money is gone. Now, compared to that, if Indian railway, suppose you have a passenger train ticket, if you leave that train, you can at least board that train. I mean, this kind of, if you use time as a slave of money making, then no matter how much we do meditation with Thich Nhat Hanh, now our ability you know, would be our system would compromise in such a way. So therefore, social transformations I have spoken about, how do we transform existing arrangement? Then happiness, well-being, and ananda. Now, happiness and well-being has a subjective dimension. I'm happy with little things, yes. But I am happy with little knowledge, yes. But also that subjective dimension of happiness must be offered to other people, not in a judgmental way. Therefore, we can strive for greater and greater potential. So I would like to bring the subjective dimension, objective dimension. For example, I can say that I can leave, sleep without the mosquito net. Many people are saying, you know, Yes, it is good. <laughs> you can do a mantra and sleep without mosquito net. But then it cannot go on for a long time. With the corona also, you know, that we say that if our mind is strong, then corona would not touch us. It can go maybe one or two steps. But therefore, the subjective and the objective needs to be engaged simultaneously. Because many times our subjective consideration of well-being because of the way we have been naturalized, to think of a girl who has been told by her mother that you become happy by waking up at four o'clock and waking up before your husband wakes up and then preparing all the food. She has listened to that her whole life. Therefore, that subjective well-being, now is it, and, and the whole question of well-being and justice that London for so happiness and ananda, that ananda takes us from a momentary sense of happiness to something deeper. And well-being also has a dimension of ill-being, because there are many ways in which, as Minati was saying, that there can be toxic positivity. Just to smile all the time can hide a lot of pain and suffering. So the pathology that is there, we have to be attentive to. So moving on, let me say that happiness also is related to self-development and friendship with others. Self-development meaning that how do we create a process of niskama karma, detachment. Happiness is related to friendship with others. Friendship is very important for happiness. Happiness, we understand it in the context of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now, liberty, equality, these two ways of the modern world also has to be related to happiness. Because in an unequal society, there are limits to be happy and fraternity. The whole brotherhood and sisterhood. Gandhi, Sri Aurobindo, Ambedkar, and Pope Francis. Pope Francis has recently gifted very important encyclical called Fratelli Tutti on friendship and social fraternity, in which 
Pope is saying, to care for the world in which we live means to care for ourselves. The big quotation, I'm not going into detail. In the next paragraph, Pope is giving a very important example. He's saying that how Francis of Assisi, he walked all the way from Assisi in Italy to meet Sultan Malik al Kamil in Egypt. That way to border cross, because there was a war going on, that is a very important step. Only when we can move from our home to the other, even our so called enemy, it creates possibilities for happiness. Then, friendship with others, beauty, dignity, and dialogue. Friendship with self and others. Friendship beyond the dualism of self and others. Friendship with self and inclusion of the other. I want to suggest that as much as we can include everybody in our life, then it becomes a process of generation of happiness. It is possible to include quite a lot. But that inclusion also can still be very paternalistic. I am including you. Therefore, I am bringing the part of friendship in together with inclusion of the other. For example, Habermas talks about, the great philosopher Habermas, he talks about inclusion of the other. In India also, social inclusion is a very important theoretical and policy. So I think Sipra is present in our seminar today and our respected friend and teacher, Professor T.K. Umen from JNE, he ha also has been talking about inclusion, social inclusion. But to social inclusion, I am adding in a language of social embrace because inclusion can be still very paternalistic. As Habermas says that yes, his own idea of philosophy and ethics comes from Judeo-Christian tradition. And he does not have as much knowledge about other traditions, for example, Buddhist tradition or Islamic tradition. So there is a need for transformative border crossing for happiness as part of friendship and inclusion. Then we also need friendship with nature that has been already pointed to. Across this is dignity. For example, in the context of climate change, thinkers like Donna Haraway, Bruno Latro, and Dipesh Chakravarti, they are telling us about it. Happiness also calls for social transformation. For example, you look at our land system. Now, Ekta Parishad and that Rajgopal Bhai and our friends, they are fighting for land dignity, Vinaba Bhape, Kudan movement. If in a village, there is land or at least some dignity of land for everybody, that village would be very happy. And here my friend, Johanna Smith from Denmark, he is saying that in Bhutan, there is a discourse of gross national happiness. But that does not include the question of land ownership. And slowly it is coming. So gross national happiness also must include issues like land, property and power. We know Bhutan has become a democratic country and it is slowly making steps towards democratic transformation, which we can welcome as a part of effort of happiness. Then Jeffrey Sachs, The Price of Civilization, the book I read in fact when I was in Bhutan in 2013, he's writing an on, the unexamined life is not worth living, said Socrates. We might equally say that the unexamined economy is not capable of securing for wealth. For example, on unexamined economy, where we are emphasizing only on money, money, and money. Then we need mindful work. Then we also need new kind of institutions, as Berry uh, is saying. I think it is coming here. And we need the art of generating the impossible. And generating the impossible 
calls for a kind of gift relationship. So happiness and gifts. And gift is also, it is not just conditional gift, but unconditional gift. And here, from the Islamic tradition, my friend Adi Shataya from, my, uh, from uh, Malaysia, he's talking about Islamic gift economy. Then happiness is related to creativity. For example, this poem. Can you write a poem? Maybe that is good. You are a soul of possibility. Can you write a poem? This is not my theme. I would tell my daughter or my husband. But can your creativity be substituted by another? Maybe not. I express my creativity in beauty and austerity. The beauty of austerity, austerity of beauty. I live with little. Do not discard the old. I live with joy. Bring joy to the streets and soul. I play colors with self and the society. Holy with holiness and wholeness. Bindu and Brahmanda flow in my hair. Am I also not a bird, a bird of creativity? And given uh, Professor Chetri's point about uh, sleeping and time use, I want to present also this poem very briefly. Time. Time is sleeping in the painted breast of the stones. Time is singing in the braided hair of the forest lake. Time is dancing in the soft leaves of the waves. Time is waking up in moments of our embrace. In our time, it is our fact that we run with time. We dance and make time dance. But our friends come to the million breasts of love, nature, and history, where time is sleeping and snoring in yoga nidra. Oh, friends, let us sleep with time. We press our head and hand. Put oil in our tired bodies and souls. We breathe slowly. We put our hands across our hearts. Sleeping with time, we weave many quills. We cover us with quills. We make each other work. We weave many threads of connections, many new yoga. So happiness, well-being, and ananda invites us for many kinds of yoga, critical, creative, and transformative. Thank you, dear friends, for our journey together. Now we'll nurture ourselves with thoughts, questions, and reflections. To initiate this, let me invite Gyan Luigi, please. Dear Gyan Luigi, you are our <laughs> our friend, philosopher, and yes. guide from thank Vienna. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. I, can you hear me? Because my internet connection was yes. a little different. bit disturbed, but it depends on me. No, uh, thank you very much. Well, I thank you. Uh, well, I would make perhaps a short observation. That is, uh, I think that when we speak of um, of needs of people, for instance, I heard before in the first a wonderful exposition. I think uh, this is completely right, uh, but there is a problem perhaps to it because, um, well, some time ago I dealt a little bit with the problem of water and of the rights right to water, which every individual should be assigned to, should be acknowledged to. And I noticed at that time in some books that, that there is a problem on the question of the term, the very term need, because sometimes this term, this word, is abused in order to substitute right. It is, for instance, in the question of water and of that access to public water, that is against the privatization of water, which has been fulfilled in some countries as United Kingdom over the last years, the concept 
of, uh, of need was used in order to say, well, there is no uh, right of the individual to have access to water, there is only a need. Therefore, since there is no right of the individual to have access to public water, it is a question of for the, it is a problem of the individual to have access to water. That is the government, for instance, the government, the nation, the country has no duty. That is, there is a correlation, no right of the individual, therefore no duty of the government to at least try to give access to the individual to water. This, I think the problem of need is, of the, of the very word need is a very interesting problem and should be perhaps uh, analyzed further. This is the first thing that I had to, because it, it practically, if to the individuals are acknowledged only needs and no rights, well, then the question of the happiness is, is put in doubt. If I have no right or less right than I should have, I how to have, I should to, to, to have acknowledged, then I have minor opportunities to, to reach happiness. That of the water is an example, is it? Of course, it's a very important example, but it's not the only one. The second one, the second observation I would like to, to do is this one, this, I think about Amartya Sen, that Sen has said something uh, in a certain sense, um, uh, not so much polemical, but um, critical of the, of the very concept of happiness in relation to the use which utilitarian do of it. Therefore, for instance, uh, Sen has written beyond utilitarianism because he says that, in my opinion, it is interesting to this, this uh, observation of Sen, that uh, happiness uh, is not so easy to measure. That is, you can be happy also if you have nothing. You can be happy also if you have no rights. That is, happiness is a criterion of measure uh, to the or to the conditions of the people or of the individual, which is not so much reliable. That is at least the impression that I have reading Sen. And I think perhaps also under the influence of Mabubulak, the late Mabubulak, you prefer always to speak all of development, that is, of the opportunities, of the chances, as regards, of course, development, as regards the possibilities which one has, rather than to speak of the happiness. This is a question which, in my opinion, deserves being uh, analyzed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gian Luigi. We have with us many new friends also. I see Urmimala Das. So Urmimala Appa, and I also see Santos uh, Kumar Bishwar. So Urmimala Appa, Santos, Saji, and also Sangeeta Appa, Tuli Didi. These four friends, one or two minutes each, please. Good evening, everyone. It is a beautiful session. Uh, I have learned so many things from this chapter, this session. Really, happiness is a need of the hour. And as Corona has uh, uh, some, uh, it has demoralized many people. It has uh, broken the um, root of the happiness, but still then this uh, session has given us the, uh, given us a very uh, fine and very minute uh, 
way of living happily in this pandemic situation. Thank you, Antavai. Many, many thanks. Namaskar. Namaskar. Antavai and to all. Yeah, I am Urmi. Uh, actually, I have, I, I, I am in a, in, I don't know whether it is spiritual or what, in that journey. And when I found this topic, it is really, really attracted me to listen to you all. And I have learned many things from Professor Chetri uh, up to, oh, I don't remember, the uh, third, third person who presented and yours also. Uh, very uh, different type of uh, understanding the uh, concept of happiness, perceiving, and, uh, it is really, really, really very good. And uh, I have learned, and I, I will try to imbibe many things, starting from uh, inhaling processes of to positive thinking and also this social construct and uh, uh, development of thank you uh, so, thank you so, uh, yes so good evening everyone uh, it, it's a very wonderful session of i'm really sorry that i joined very late and uh, I think uh, what one, one of the passive participants said that happiness is the need of the art. And uh, yes, uh, we are in the very gloomy and very troubled times. Uh, I think this uh, the session of this kind will be really instrumental, you know, to uh, to master our courage and to give uh, much of happiness to all of us. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, I wish you all the best for the program. Thank you. Thank you. So, Saji, please. Thank you very much, Professor Ananta. I have uh, some doubts with regards to the wonderful presentation. Uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, all the speakers. And my concern, small concern I have put in the chat, I would, uh, since you are giving me an opportunity to raise these issues, um, I'm no one in front of the learned scholars and also the Bante who presented wonderfully uh, compiling the social, political, moral, and also psychological aspects of happiness. And uh, the doubt that I have in my mind with regards to the points that had been raised by Professor Chatri is this. There are just two. One is, unlike in Vedanta, and also of the later part of the Holy Bible, where Paul makes a mention of grace of God, and also the bhakti aspect, which is there in Ramanuja's Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta, even though co-ecological aspects and also the universal aspects that had been emphasized, both physical and non-physical. Yet, yet a theistic element I felt is missing in the presentation of Professor Chetri. Maybe I missed it. Uh, this is what I felt is wanting. I'm no one, um, sorry. Forgive me for pointing it out, but I, I would like to know where the spiritual elements lies, if it is only in a, in a universalistic approach or an integrative approach of the ecological and the non-ecological, that is where the spiritual elements, but once he seemed to have mentioned a compromise, a definition, a definition that he had of, had of happiness, he seems to have put spiritual principles, but elsewhere, the chanting of the mantras to the divine, that was missing from the presentation. Now, uh, it is not proper on my part to ask a monk what is the importance of the divinity, 
but I'm only raising this concern because none of those practical lessons which he had given where a prayer was mentioned, even though at the end there was a prayer that he read out, but the practical lessons which were given, uh, the bodily organs, he's asking the bodily organs and also the, the other parts, even including the physical aspects to also be recognized and its attributes to be highlighted. But um, a prayer to the divine surprisingly was missing. Uh, this is one. And the second is, I'm very sure that uh, uh, Professor Chetri belongs to Buddhist tradition. Now, uh, one concern that I had with regards to the Madhyamika school of the middle path. Now the contemporary life, the contemporary world, the contemporary living, which calls for patience, moksha, which asks for also compassion and pity to be shown to the other, would middle path suffice here? Would it not actually ask for even the contemporary, even the the pandemic situation that faced, if somebody were to stick to middle path, would, would it take us out from this crisis that we have faced? So an empathy in its extremity, does it not uh, require its exposition from the individuals at the moment? This is another. Professor Ananto, as usual, Every lecture that we listen to from you is always inspiring. And thank you for this inspiration that you have brought even in evening's lecture today. Uh, you brought in uh, Professor Sen, and I don't think you made a mention of Nasubam. Both of them uh, seem to have touched upon capabilities. Uh, so justice seemed to be linked to happiness. Because unless and until, if justice is not provided uh, in terms of also materiality, how can the larger section of the society be happy? So justice is linked to happiness. Somewhere you seem to have mentioned the subjective and the objective. Uh, what should be the meeting ground between these two? Professor Anta, inclusive aspect that you brought in it uh, made me happy and uh, Habermas that you have referred to. Thank you very much. This is only a comment, but I would like to know about that meeting aspect. And uh, you would always refer to the transformative. Uh, this is a unique feature of your lectures. Transformative, transformative justice, transformative peace. Do you see that even in ha happiness? a transformational part in happiness. Does your concept of transformative, does it also apply to this, this state of mind, which we call as happiness? Thank you very much. Thank you, dear Sati. Thank you. Now, we are slowly being embraced by time. I request three friends to get ready. Naomi, Sandhyapa and Prabhatiapa. So Naomi, please. Naomi. Good evening, everyone. I'm very grateful to have attended this session. I thank Mina for the invitation. It was definitely a unnecessary topic to have, especially with the challenges the world is facing. But like Saji said, I think the spiritual aspect was lacking. Um, allow me to say I'm, I'm a, Christ, a Christian, born again Christian. And the way I, I define it is that God is love. And when it comes to people's happiness, what they're constantly looking for is love. And even when you hear them describe what they love, someone will tell you, I love Chevra. And it's a bit distorted to describe Chevra in the volume of love, but the human mind is always looking for evidence of that thing that you love that makes you happy. So 
when it comes to happiness, I think we address the things that give us happiness. But probably to have um, an all-rounded conversation, it was important to perhaps highlight things that drain your happiness and how you can recover from it. I think many um, address something on trauma uh, they faced as a family, and these are people I know, so I concur with her conversation. But probably, uh, and especially in the middle of pandemic, we should have looked at the struggle in finding happiness because happiness can be elusive depending on the stage of life you are in. I think I have a lot more to say, but I'm going to yield the floor so that we can hear from the, uh, from the others. But that is not to discount the fact that the session was highly informative, captivating, and educational. I yield the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. What do you do, Naomi? If you please put up your video, we can see you for a moment. Um, thank you. My name is Naomi. I'm a business lady in, in Kenya. Uh, sorry, I did not put up my video initially. I was having problems and because I, I woke up late. I've had a very hectic week, so I ended up sleeping um, longer. In fact, uh, if it wasn't for the session, I'd have probably spent the entire day in bed because I have a, a hectic week ahead. But I'm going to join this um, next time. I'm still in my pajama and gown. That's why even after we were able to sort out the video issue, I was not able to connect. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. We welcome you to our journey. Now, Sandhya, please. Sandhyaapa, are you there? Sandhyaapa, you unmute yourself. Okay, please speak. She has unmuted, but the sound is not coming. Okay, the sound is not coming. Yes. Okay, so we'll listen to her a little later. Now, Prabhati Appa, please. Prabhati Appa, she has just joined. Would you like to share your thought, Prabhati Appa? Okay. So in that case, we are taking time. So mm -hmm. now, Professor Chetri, we request you to kindly share your thoughts on the reflections in two to three minutes, please. We are grateful to you, Professor Chetri. Perhaps Chetri sir has left. He dropped the message. He had a meeting. Okay, so now Devendra, please. Okay, thank you, sir, uh, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I have some observations uh, from the points highlighted by Chetri, sir. Uh, overall, the presentation was mesmerizing and very uh, informative and well presented. So a uh, few things I noted down and the first, uh, while Sir was talking about happiness, uh, uh, 
the kind of things one should do in order to maintain happiness and in that order sir uh, mentioned so many things and one point uh, it's uh, there i have noted down that is money cannot buy happiness of course money cannot buy happiness and to elaborate a little i will not take more than 2 3 minutes so money cannot buy happiness uh, on the same theme uh, the famous indian uh, novelist mulkraj anand has written a story the lost child the lost child is complete depiction of money cannot buy happiness in the story one child with his parents uh, though parents are not rich in terms of money uh, that child is accompanied by them to a fair and that child is attracted towards all the sweet dis- sweet stalls toys and everything which was displayed uh, for sale so he was very happy for those materialistic things but all of sudden as the crowd increased that that boy separated uh, from his parents and definitely it was a kind of uh, great misery for parents as well as child although uh, parents were searching at their end and child was also trying to find them but at the child was small he was crying so one gentleman picked that child and he took it in his lab and he that that gentleman was rich enough to purchase everything so that gentleman was offering that child anything and everything the most costly thing uh, which was there uh, to be purchased by uh, those who were attending that fair but that child this time when he had an option to get anything and everything this time that child was crying for his parents you know i don't want costly toys i don't want sweet dishes i want my mom i want my dad so taking an inspiration from that episode of the story and for today's uh, webinar only i composed a poem so uh, i would like to recite that poem and that will be the end of from my side happiness is the title of my poem and it begins uh, usually like i mean here it begins what is happiness like the taste of sweet it cannot be defined rather it can be realized when a beggar gets food when a farmer is successful in his deed they feel very good and it is happiness for them indeed someone feels happy in donating the man in need while others are happy in serving the poor without any greed nothing can please a child more than his parents all the toys and luxuries are useless in their absence winning makes happy both politicians and players they play their games with utmost care but few believe in everything is fair in love and war that is the chief cause of all corruptions in society at par which later becomes the source of all fear and man is left to suffer on his fate full of despair now man should not forget the fundamental law of nature once happiness can be the cause of sadness for other thus embrace and console the sad without any reservation you will get many happy occasions for celebration but your gesture of showing humanity on sad man is better than service of a god of god or devotee ever can so thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me the time sir oh. i think we have slowly with the yes part of time to be able to so any other and... friends uh, who would like to share his thought you are welcome so devendra sir over to you thank you uh, both of you okay okay thank you very much so uh, first of all i thank everybody every participant every uh, distinguished speaker and co learners and now uh, to begin with formal word of thanks it's my honor and privilege to ex- extend this oath of word of thanks on behalf of school of humanities 
Raffles University and uh, Ray's Global Foundation, uh, as well as Vishwanidham Center for Asian Blue Zooming, Puducherry and Chennai. To extend a vote of thanks, and first of all, uh, I would express my heartfelt gratitude and thanks to Dr. Samdu uh, Chetri sir for his brilliant presentation and teaching us the lesson uh, to be happy. Second, uh, I would like to express my thanks to Minuti Prathanji for her brilliant presentation and very uh, effective as well as full of informative it was. So ma'am, thanks a lot for your presentation. Uh, I would like to express my thanks to Professor Anand Girishal for his presentation as well as uh, guiding us and inspiring us to conduct such kind of activities. I would also like to thank uh, revered Dr. Justice Meena Vigombar, uh, who is patron of Raffles University, for giving us freedom to organize such kind of activities. I express my thanks to Professor Divakar Goli, Honorable Vice Chancellor of Raffles University, for uh, his cooperation and a kind of inspiration he gives us for organizing such kind of events. I would like to thank uh, uh, Mr. Gian Luigi uh, for uh, the kind of dialogue uh, he uh, came out with to make uh, this session a lively session. Uh, I my thanks goes to uh, Professor Saji Vargi sir for his uh, very critical appreciation of the whole session and definitely it was commendable. Everybody, all the participants, all co-learners, everyone, all the guests uh, are definitely, uh, means I, I'm, I'm giving uh, my thanks to everybody. Last but not the least, I would like to uh, convey my gratitude to Professor Andhir Gautam for uh, planning, executing, and conducting this session successfully. So thank you, everybody, from the bottom of my heart. Namaste. Thank you, Namaste. Devendra Sandeep. Welcome, sir. I, I just remember that Saji had asked. <laughs> oh, yes, if yes. Not, uh, if we do not be with Saji in his questions, <laughs> then the gods would not smile on us. <laughs> <laughs> it is in that spirit. The very important question, like the subjective and the objective coming together in happiness. As Gyan was saying, that most of the time, our subjective assumption of happiness hides a lot of things. So therefore, the objective and the subjective have to come together in the media. And the objective, not killing the subjective, the subjective is not too much bound within itself that even if you know one is bitten, then one would say, say that, oh, I am not bitten, it is just a slap of love. You know? So all these things, you know, what is the objective criteria? You know? All these things, for example, you know, speaking of Quran, not only holy Quran, but there are some people among our Muslim brothers who justify beating the women, still justify it. And there was a public conversation about it and one great uh, you know, preacher said, yes, you have to beat it, but maybe you <laughs> do it in such a way that as if you are putting a handkerchief in the pocket of the sleeper. <laughs> so therefore the subjective and the objective. Now with the Taliban, one Taliban spokesperson, when he was asked that why there is no woman cabinet, <laughs> and he said that okay, so their face is not in the cabinet, then you know, they would have to give birth to children and rats and all these things. You know. The second thing is about transformation. Because happiness again can be too much, too much within itself. So therefore, the transformative dialogues, you know, the sense of adventure. Yes, we know that we would have to be content, but we also have to jump to a sense of discontent. And therefore, like the divine discontent. Our uh, Chittabhai from Odisha used to say that you always must be discontent. And that discontent is not grumbling, it is a divine discontent. 
divya asantosha what is that divine discontent that divine discontent is not satisfied with whatever potential we have realized so far so that is transformation and one part of that transformation is happiness and ananda so how do we cultivate ananda with the seeds of happiness so thank you dear friends i think minus you would like to say yeah yeah i will my question remain unanswered i mean i i wanted to ask how to get over the toxic positivity you know like uh, if you see the psychological point of view and the i mean whatever khetri was presenting there should be some balance i mean you cannot remain sad for longer time but there should be some way how to switch from negativity to positivity those things i wanted to listen from him but he has left So we will and thank your kind words. We will pursue that. I could not hear. Yeah. So we will, huh, we will pursue these thoughts, but again, that the the way out of hopelessness is to be with the moment. Yeah. Now, if if I am in a moment of anger, not to deny that moment. What is the source of that anger? So therefore, just putting a sugar-coated smile, mm. it's not helpful. You have to touch that moments of anger, and then. But we also have to be point not to be bound to that. Mm. So yes, uh, yes, I had one thing to uh, say that uh, that's a very important question. uh there are certain ways of thinking that keep you caught in the entitlement of anger and these uh entitlement beliefs chokes all kind of relationship so check and see which errors of thinking you hold that create problem of yourself and problems of others so that thing comes with awareness or realization yes yes mm-hmm. so with these words yeah. thank you so much yeah, thank, and, you. Uh, thank, thank you thank you and thank as you. you go so we have to stand up all of you stand up please <laughs> yes <laughs> mm. so we can do a little kirtan <laughs> Yes. But I cannot see the screen. Ah, yeah. Oh. Om. Oh. Oh. It's louder, Anand. Why not audible? Oh. Ananda Mai Chaitanya Mai. Please join me, all of you. आनंदमाई चैतन्य मई आनंदमाई चैतन्य मई satyamai parame and we give each other a hug eh hug. yes so satyamai because of corona it is all missing we had seminars and all we yes. to and thank you and, let, and thank you now we for joining and i just want to say let us get ready for next week next sunday yeah. we will have christian with us on mm-hmm. gandhi and fascism gandhi and fascism yes <laughs> thank you thank you okay. thank you thank you all thank you everybody